friends uh, at summer school. Hello, it's nice to meet you. Um, I'm speaking to my own phone, which is strange, uh, but that really is the least of it. So what I'm going to try and do is condense into perhaps 20 minutes uh, the entire practice and field of what is known as a samic writing. A samic writing is essentially writing which has no discernible or deliberately discernible semantic content. A samic writing is a practice that's really important to me as someone who's interested in the possibilities of literature and poetry. And I would argue it is the most overlooked practice of poetic arts in the UK and, and in a lot of places around the world. And I will explain why. So, once more, a samic writing might also be called pansamic writing, as the definition basically means that which has no semantic content, or pansamic meaning that the semantic content could mean anything. Now, traditionally, this might be made by hand or can be made digitally, but imagine a scribble, a scrawl, some sort of um, new language some markings upon the page that can't be immediately discerned. Here is a piece of work by the Belarusian poet Ekaterina Semigliona, who basically created a brand new language of marks and etches on the page. And not to be one of those ego people who teach their own work, but there is some of my Asamic work. Can you read that? Is it backwards on the video? This is mysterious, but does it mean something? It depends entirely on the subjective finishing of the reader in reading these pieces. A big passion of mine is to ask the questions that get to the fundamental root of the reasons why I'm doing things that a lot of people would quite rightly see as completely self-indulgent and pointless because they're not immediately understandable to the, um, to the person who has been trained uh, in the ways that we are taught in the UK how to read and discern poetic or literary value. What is poetry fundamentally made of? It is not made of emotion or expression. It is made of language. Language is a series of uh, marks and etches upon the paper that varies from culture to culture, historical precedent to historical precedent, that is um, under the glowering thumb of linguistics. And so the poet is responsible to what language is made of. And what is the visual character of writing before we get into its semantic content? As I say to people a lot of the time, how do we discern the difference between that which we see and that which we read? When you walk into a room and you see the walls in the same way that you open the page of a book, do you first see it and then read it? Of course you do, but the way our conscious mind is trained to focus on that page of the book as a thing to be read, to extrapolate and discern semantic content first and foremost overlooks the visual beauty, the compositional interest, the subjective meaning of the appearance of those words upon the page. And of course, this is fundamental to things like graphic design and the history of concrete poetry. That is poetry that has its meaning in its uh, visual character upon the page, as well as its semantic meaning, is tied in to the post-Second World War technology boom, which created and helped the growth of the plastic arts, graphic design, architecture, these things interacting with a new kind of poetry, concrete poetry, which was very much against the um, heavy emphasis of emotional weight, sentimental lyricism that drives still to this day a lot of people's opinions on what actually defines poetry. And that for no um, small reason was because the lyrical sentiment and grand feeling of Central European poetry in that part of the 20th century obviously was used for, for positive messages, but also negative ones too, like um, in Germany. So the, the concrete poetry movement tried to focus purely on what actually language was made of as fields of uh, linguistic become more popular, structuralism, post-structuralism, things that I'm sure a lot of people have come across. But I'm not really interested in the theory. I'm interested in the practice. So if we are looking now as um, poetry being something that is made out of a very specific material, a mysterious material, as well as being something that gives semantic meaning, and we start to investigate what are the possibilities of utilising that material towards a non-semantic orientated practice, when we move away from that which is concrete and designed with lettering, and language as these blocks, we start to look at what handwritten things do. And 
one of the fundamental elements of uh, uh, Assamic writing in the in the way that I've tried to connect it to so many different movements is that it appears in uh, visual art practice a great deal. We need only look uh, a very famous uh, abstract artist like uh, Cy Twombly or Jackson Pollock to see uh, fundamentally a samic practice being um, used without that word necessarily. So this is very much a ubiquitous practice in the modern arts um, that we might even see in Jean-Michel Basquiat, that we might see in uh, a great deal of... Um, of the most key uh, experimental poets of the 20th century in Central Europe, from Henri Michaud and Christian Dautremont, the Cobra group, to um, a great deal of 21st century Assamic practitioners. So, as is often the case, maybe we look to Assamic writing, and, and you'll find many people say, as they would say, of say sound poetry, that it's not poetry, it's a kind of music vocalization. It's completely fine if you think this is handwriting art, or if you think this is abstract uh, visual art, modern art, that simply uses writing um, and the marks of writing. It's the same thing with a different name. I think it's fundamentally poetic, and that might be because I am mostly interested in poetry and writing, and I think anything that's language referent fundamentally is poetry if you have to put a label on it. But um, I think there's a reason why it was so ubiquitous in visual art, but it didn't pop up in poetry, and it has, again, to do with the history of those things. So a samic writing, if you are looking at something that might be more um, direct as a kind of prompt or engagement, would be doodling, scrawling, scribbling. One of the things I suggest a lot of the time when I'm teaching people to do is to simply keep with them a journal that they constantly illustrate with abstract markings, or I suggest that they're trying to get their brain into a state where they're flowing, where they're down-regulating their prefrontal cortex and not concentrating by doing the thing that they would do when they were bored at work anyway. The practice of doodling and the practice of scrawling or writing notes or letters that are not meant to be understood is, in a sense, therapeutic. And that would be my first port of call when thinking about prompting someone to engage in asamic writing. So if we've established what asamic writing is and where it might appear, we are talking about a kind of languageless handwriting. We are talking about a poetry that does not put semantic meaning or immediately decipherable meaning at the forefront of its practice. We are perhaps just talking about forgotten scrolls, lost notes, someone's shopping list that you've picked up in a car park that has blurred ink on it and you can't quite read it but you kind of can. We are then talking about something that's a universal kind of language because if it has no central semantic meaning, then everyone reads it the same, whether you speak uh, English or whether you read the Cyrillic alphabet or whether you come from a completely different culture. The experience of coming across this handwritten, this, um, this kind of writing meaning that's not about the words in the writing is then one that is open. So if someone is not interested in it, they will think a samic writing is kind of abstract nonsense, but if they are and they pay attention to it, as with all things, they can discern from that something which already is existing in their own brain. So the meaning of the writing is subjectively connected to what they're seeing, kind of like the principle of a Horshack test, where you look at an abstract shape and you engage with it. And of course, there's these specious ideas around specifically handwriting in, say, criminology, when they look at the loops of your letters and decide whether or not you're a murderer or something like that, which is mostly debunked, but it's still about the fundamental idea that people's signatures is a, more better, is a better example that you carry with you in your writing, in the fundamental monkey marks that make up the whole miracle of written language, you carry a character within you that a samic writing or pan samic writing expresses. Let me think of another prompt. You want to write a sequence of poems that are about a certain subject or a feeling. Now imagine that you decide, okay, this sequence of poems that's about a bird you've seen or being uh, uh, you know, in a strange mood or reading a newspaper or some political opinion or whatever it is that you want to write your poetry collection about. Think about writing that and think about how your mind would go about creating the words and the structure. Now, before you do so or after you do so, take a pen and take a white piece of paper, close your eyes and write that out freely. Write it in the dark. Write it without trying to write words. Express it in the shapes of the writing. But write the same idea. Keep it in your mind. Just try not to use the words directly. 
write it when you've just woken up, write it in the middle of the night, write it with uh, things covering your eyes so you can't possibly see. Then open it up and look at it and look at what the character is of that writing. Look at what the gesture, the creative urge that you've had that's a mystery for all of us when we start to make these creative decisions is done through your hand, through your pen man or pen woman ship. What is the thing that you've expressed there? Is it a translation of the idea or is it a different variation? Asamic writing to me is fundamentally a different poetic tool. And I believe that concrete poetry and the skill of graphic design, sound poetry and the ability to express non-semantic sounds that evoke speech meanings as well, if not better than normal speech, uh, asamic writing, the engagement with handwriting and abstraction in language and letters itself. These are all poetic tools that complement a central engagement with language that might produce what people think is more formal poetry. So if my first prompt is trying to get out of your own head, try and doodle. When you're at the cinema or when you're watching a poetry reading and it's boring you or something, not that that would ever happen, you start to make notes and sketches and doodles and you're not trying to be pictographic and draw something but you're just trying to flow and follow that movement that would be my first problem the second would be take a solid concrete idea that you think that you would turn into a normal poetry collection or even a short story and then express it with abstract writing try and avoid direct expression a third would be look at some of these great works of uh, 20th century visual um, art that I've mentioned, the abstract expressionists and um, some of the more well-known Central European um, collaborative uh, artists and, and engage with their work and try and do poetic copies, maybe just simply with a biro and a cheap piece of white paper. Try and sketch out what you think the shapes are and then try and read it. Because that's one of those key ideas that's here with the same year that I just mentioned before, which is the subjective meaning and engagement. So let me hop on ahead. One of the most important things to me when in dealing, and I mentioned this earlier in my, in my blathering rant that you must be getting tired of, is that my belief was when I started to practice certain avant-garde ideas or what people consider avant-garde and I consider completely natural but had to kind of explain it to myself, for myself, to apologise for a kind of indulgence, is to see whether or not there has been a historical uh, ubiquitous practice that engages with this, that has just been lost because of certain genre definitions. And I found that with sound poetry, a global practice of people making up languages uh, and, and not quite singing, but, but improvising a kind of non-semantic noise purely from the human voice, which it often expresses things more deep than words, which are always fraught and, um, in a Beckett sense, failures. And then I started to think with sound poetry too, like what is the noise that parents make, especially mothers, when they have a new child? Do they not create a kind of noise to their babies? And then I found studies that showed that's how empathy uh, is grown in children, these, these echoing noises. That's how language is built. What's the noise people make? When, uh, when they're exhausted or when someone bumps into them in the street or when they're by themselves talking to themselves on the bus in a normal and healthy way because I do that and so does everyone else that I speak to about it. What's the noise you make when you're have, having sex or you're exercising or you're, you're expiring in general uh, from life's uh, exhaustion or dying? <clears throat> the noise of life is not semantic. It's not, I feel tired. It's something else. It's some noise. Is that not poetic material? By the same uh, vein, with the same writing, is the history of writing not also littered with um, non-semantic expressions? Now, the most obvious of this that influenced the 20th century European Asamic poets would be the tradition of um, the handwritten manuscript, more than just the Christian monastic tradition, the, the hieroglyphic, the pictographic and the engagement with calligraphic techniques in China and Japan most famously, but also in other places. There has been, for over a thousand years, experimental calligraphy which does not have semantic content, and it's been somewhat fetishized in the West, but very much affected people like Christian Dottremont, Franz Klein, and these other abstract poet writers of the 20th century. There has been an enormous amount. I, I spent seven years working in the British Museum, and what I found out was things like the Voynich manuscript, an enormous amount of made-up languages, whether through someone being um, uh, in a state of ecstatic kind of madness, writing out new languages, creating 
new uh, neologisms with the with the with the hand or, or the logogram the history of um, a written character which represents a phrase or a word or indeed hoaxes there has been a great deal more than people think of historical asamic texts that are essentially hoaxes for people to try and decode which don't exist doodling and this is the final thing that i'm going to blather on about if there is then an interest in being open-hearted to engage with the same writing, handwriting, art through uh, scribbling and scrawling, and it is a ubiquitous historical practice of people doing it in their daily lives of uh, crossings out and, and freehand work and automatic writing through the surrealists, if there is something natural about what the human being does when making these glyphic marks that we call written language, and that shouldn't be the dominant creative element of poetry, but is undoubtedly linguistic and around a poetic meaning, then the final one, the one that really convinced me and why I say it's so important to me too, is a kind of engagement with uh, the neurology of doodling, 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 because, um, for example, when uh, I got interested in the brain, the, the human mind, and I did a project at the Welcome about, Welcome Collection, Welcome Trust about daydreaming, how daydreaming isn't seen as something negative in our culture, it's actually physiologically necessary that when you have your waking hours, there needs to be some time when you're not in your prefrontal cortex, when you are off somewhere else thinking liminally, somehow wasting your time. And one of the expressions of this, um, and David, um, I think it's called McLaughlin, wrote a wonderful book called uh, Do Doodling, History of Doodling, I think. Forgive me for not knowing the exact title of that. That's one of the ways we express the downregulation of our brain. That's why we do that in our school notebooks when we're truly bored or when we're in an office job or when we're on the way to a bus. La, 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 not really thinking, writing a samic poetry is free and engaged with the possibilities of the hand touching the pen on the paper. Now, that's very key because when I look further into some of the therapeutic ideas around, say, writing therapies, it is um, well known, although a relative mystery, although I'm not an expert and maybe someone will prove me wrong about this, but I'll say it anyway, that when people type out their writing and writing therapies, perhaps keeping a diary of, of, of bad thoughts for, for um, CBT treatment, say for depression, it is less effective when someone handwrites it. There is some mysterious connection between human expression and the um, posited catharsis that comes with that expression and writing, the written. There is something about journaling with handwritten uh, material, with keeping a notebook that you write out by hand as opposed to typing into a Word document. Now, this is key, not only because it means that perhaps samic writing, writing, which isn't first about semantic content, but writing itself uh, might be therapeutic, might be cathartic, might be a way for us to relax, to engage in a flow. And I've, I've borne this out when I've taught in universities with particularly suspicious 21 year olds and 20 of them in a room and say hey guys what we're going to do you take out a piece of white paper i'll put in a bit of music and you're just going to make some shapes just write just do your signature 50 times and you think well in the first five minutes as they do with most of the things i teach they're like what is this what are you wasting my time for by the end there is unity that people get closer they talk they relax there's something positive and therapeutic about it and i'm not going to go on about it but i'm really interested in it a same writing is also about the way the human mind works how we write and what we write with so if my first uh, prompt was um <clears throat> for you to doodle free then my last would be for you to actually try and get into a situation where you collaboratively doodle where you actually find materials like Indian ink, a nibbed pen, or a nice rollerball, a good quality GSM piece of white paper, and sit in a space with someone that you care about, or a random person on the bus, maybe approach them, uh, be careful about that, and to try and collectively talk, free your mind, listen to music, do something else, you can't do this alone, and try and actively go after an aesthetic in doodling. Feel in the same way that the magical and mysterious process of, say, painting or picking the right word in your poem or 
picking the right medium in general for your idea, this strange, mysterious creative process would happen. Feel that in the composition of abstract shapes made with your hands. Try it with felt marker pens. Try it, as I often do, with your fingers. Try and create these spaces that flow from your body and from your literal space and try and keep it focused on some sort of poetic central idea. So, Samic writing then, as I've said, is this kind of semanticless writing. And I've suggested that it is a huge part of the 20th century development of moving away from the sentiment that might be embedded in a huge emphasis in semantic content around the writing art and how I think it's strange that poets shouldn't be responsible before language first and foremost in is that's their material. Musicians work in sounds and, and musical notations and they get to talk about it in language. Sculptures, sculptors work in physical objects in three dimensions and then get to talk about it in language. Poets, especially poets over other writing arts, um, like uh, fiction writers or essay writers or non-fiction writers, have to work in the mysterious thing they then explain it about. And how do they separate it? I believe a concentration on language, a responsibility before every letter and every word. And that's not to say that semantic content is not then very important in that process, but it is to say it frees us up to worry about the shape of our letters, the size of them, the composition of them, and how mysterious and strange it is that we've agreed that these 26 characters, these glyphs, when brought together, form the words, which then brought together, form sentences, which then brought together contextually, form meaning that's never completely finished or perfectly describes things. Should we not then, as poets, be allowed to go, and with our hands or with computers, I suppose, if you must, go and express those glyphs in ways that feels free. So I've said that, and then I've said, look, you'll find loads of the same writing in 20th century um, visual art practice with the abstract expressionists, the Cobra group, a lot of the Central European people. I'm finding people all the time where I'm like, oh my God, I see language in that. Jean-Michel Basquiat saw an exhibition last year, and I was like, oh my God, there's so much of same writing here. There's so much free writing, the surrealists and all these things. So I've said that too. Then I've said, look, a same writing is connected to the, a huge human practice, a natural practice of cultural um, literary expression that's been put away from lost languages, made up languages, logograms, hieroglyphs, calligraphy, xenolinguistics, alien languages that people have made up. This is a huge field. I mentioned also that linguistics, the same ex engages with linguistic ideas in a fundamental way like structuralism and post-structuralism. And then finally I've said, hey, a same writing is connected to the brain therapeutic engagement with the idea around things like writing therapy and that is the driving force between a project I run called Poem Brew which asks people of all different backgrounds including people who have got uh, cognitive differences dyspraxia dyslexia autism and other things like that mental health challenges um, whatever that might may mean or nothing like that and not emphasizing their biographical background in that but just bringing people together around methodology to try and create a live community of people publishing books that are handmade samic pansamic uh, art poetry glyph poetry scribbles scrolls doodles trying to make it valid that we might have poetic expression around these things that other people consider to be detritus because these things if given proper attention are exciting and they engage with a fundamental poetic need of human beings to express um, certain feelings that come from uh, language orientated art I would recommend, if you are interested, away from those four prompts that I mentioned about doodling, doodling with someone else, trying to copy a piece of visual abstract art in a piece of writing, overlaying signatures, or indeed translating one of your ideas, or a previous poem, there's another one, translate one of your previously written pieces of literature into an asamic poem, do it abstractly, set yourself up with a bit of ink, invest in a nice bit of kit and play with it, play with what your um, experience is, uh, your, your, your improvised desire is when you try and get out of sight of your own head, there's some ideas and prompts. I would also recommend if you put in asamic to uh, the old Google, A-S-E-M-I-C, you will find yourself loads of resources with contemporary people who are amazing, like Tim Gaze and Michael Jacobson and Jim Leftwich and loads of people all over the world. And indeed, visit poembrew.com and you can see some of um, the events that I've done around Asamic writing. Or I've done five books of Asamic poetry too, and I'm Stephen J. Fowler, if I didn't say that before. Cool. Nice to meet you. I wish I could actually meet you, but that's never going to happen in these times. It's terrible.